boy, I put up a fight. She said, son, one day you'll thank me for having God in your life. And yeah, I know she was right. Yeah, my mama was right. Cause now I'm talking to Jesus. She got me talking to Jesus. She got me talking to Jesus. Yeah, my mama was right. Cause now I'm talking to Jesus. Yeah, I love talking to Jesus. And I'll be talking to Jesus for the rest of my life. What a friend we have. What a friend we have together, together. don't you know? What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what a friend we have. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, I've got three of my own. Trying to raise them up right now. My oldest is 15. I remember what that was like. Trying to deal with the trauma. Trying to figure out the questions in the life. And I've been looking for a way to show me how to make it all right. He walked in my room while I was singing my prayers the other night. He said, I'll come back later. I can tell you got a lot on your mind. I said, it's not an interruption. You couldn't have picked a better time. Because I was just talking to Jesus. Come over and give it a try. We started talking to Jesus. We started talking to Jesus. We started talking to Jesus. Oh, and now he's talking to Jesus. Thank God he's talking to Jesus.
Father, to you be the glory forever and ever. God, just help us to be mindful of you working in our lives. Help us to know you and trust you. God, just, we 
trust that you will continue your work in us. And um, God, just help us. Thank you. And we love you. I ask you to bless this time. I say this in your son's holy name. Amen.
it. So pursue Christ together. Will you guys please have this time of fellowship and welcome one another this morning.
Alicia, thank you for letting me read through this morning. Again, we're reading uh, Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10 out of the ESV. Paul, an apostle not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be a cursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For now, I am now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. God, help us to be bearers, hearers, and doers of your word. Amen. support uh, for my family <laughs> as we have been uh, kind of one, two, three, four, five, six punched by illness this winter. Um, it's, it's good to be on the mend. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for all the prayers and for also just the meals and love. We have truly felt uh, loved and cared for and appreciated as well as my parents <coughs> um, with the meals you've dropped off for them. Thank you so much. Um, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Apparently that's a thing. <laughs> Do we have any Chief fans in the house? Woo! One plus a wavy hand. <laughs> Do we have any 49ers fans? No. Do we have any Taylor Swift fans? No. <laughs> Two. <laughs> and a whole bunch of boos. Okay. Well, um, <coughs> I'll just let y'all figure that out then because it doesn't seem like we're very passionate. Who, who, who do we support on here? The Broncos maybe? Ish the Seahawks. Yeah. yeah, there's no. Yeah, there's okay. <laughs> anyway, don't worry. If you have a team, you lived in DFW for years. They will always break your heart. So it's good not to have a team. Anyway, welcome. If you're listening online, if you're here today, uh, like I said, good to be with you. Um, there is a listener outline. Uh, so if you do not have a copy, please just uh, wave your hand, and someone will get you one. Uh, there's some hands being waved. And that is an opportunity just to take notes as we uh, move through this uh, sermon and this series. And we are, we are beginning a new series through the book of Galatians, uh, six chapters long. So we'll, this will be where we're parked, basically, uh, up until Memorial Day or so. We're taking a, a brief break uh, for Easter and Good Friday and, and uh, that whole important time of year. Uh, also, uh, just quick announcement, I, I'll try to remember again at the end, but there is a prayer service uh, for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes after for, um, that's going to meet 
uh, that is specifically just earmarked towards praying for our children. So if you have an opportunity to stay uh, behind for a few minutes after the service, we're going to be praying for the little ones, just uh, for the volunteers and for, for little ones, just that God will continue to move there. Um, our children that do come, uh, they love coming to church, and we want to make sure that God is just in the center of it. Um, I have been, uh, we, we also just finished up our series on joy. Hopefully that was a blessing to everybody, and uh, we were all reminded and encouraged and built up um, in this wonderful gift that we have through the Holy Spirit and through salvation in Christ, a joy that the world does not understand. So may we uh, grasp that, may we live in it, uh, may we rejoice in it. And uh, <coughs> as we move into this new series, uh, I, I have to stop because in the last few weeks I've done a winter joke each week and people have actually laughed. So until you stop laughing, I will keep joking, okay? <laughs> you already laughed, so you get one next week. Here we go. Okay, here's a winter joke. <clears throat> I'm embarrassed I'm even doing this one. But, but it was that good and that bad at the same time. Dad joke, week whatever we're on. So why was the new blanket in tatters after just one short winter? Because the snuggle is real. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> few claps, few laughs, okay. <laughs> That's a good one, right? Don't, don't use it. That's mine. <laughs> I found on the internet. Okay, so um, I have a question for you. As we, as we move into Galatians, this is, um, we're, we're going to set the stage. We're going to talk a whole bunch about it, but this is the first letter written by the Apostle Paul, and it is um, written to the early church who up to this point, the Gospels probably were not in circulation yet. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And so what they had was the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures. I have a question for you. Who here has ever read through the Old Testament just kind of in order? Okay. Now, I'm going to share my experience, and I do, wanna, I do not want to project it on you, but I would not be surprised if my experience relates a little bit, in, at least in part or in full, to some of your experience. When I read through the Old Testament, I, I realize that we serve an amazing God. This is a God who has created the heavens and the earth. This is a God who has made great promises. Uh, this is a God who has done miracle after miracle, right? This is a God where you see he's, he's bestowed great blessing upon individuals and people groups. You also see this is a God who has pronounced judgment and woe on those who have been rebellious and wicked. Um, I, I think reading through the Old Testament, at least for me, it produces this desire to see God move in mighty ways. Um, but it also creates, I, I believe, at least through my interpretation, if I'm not careful, uh, an interpretation where the Lord's blessing is basically achieved through obedience and God's judgment or kind of, you know, chastisement and, and stiff hand comes against me if I, if I don't do things well, right? And so it creates almost this internal anxiety separate from the New Testament. If I'm just reading the Old Testament, where I'm trying to live in such a way as to earn God's favor and not earn his smite. Is that fair? <clears throat> right? It's like I want the blessing, I want the miracles, I, I want to be in God's good graces, and simultaneously, I don't want to get squashed, I, like, right? I don't want to be wicked, I don't want to be counted among the unrighteous. And what that does is it actually puts a lot of pressure on you. And I remember the first time I read through the Old Testament as as I would say, a young adult, I was probably in my early 20s, and, and this was the sentiment that I walked away with, and what it actually left me was this place where I knew the gospel, I knew the good news, I knew that Jesus saves, but since I was so parked in the Old Testament and not spending time in the gospels and in the New Testament epistles, I, it created actually a lot of pressure and anxiety in me. <coughs> and I think that we all have a tendency in some, at some points to like the Old Testament and to even go back to it because things seem very linear in the Old Testament. Do this and this happens. Don't do this. 
and here's the consequences, right? And it gives the illusion of control. But as we really understand the, the whole narrative of creation all the way until the end of days, we see that God's actually the one in control from start to finish. And it's God's story, but it's told in such a way where if, I, if I'm not careful, I, I, I walk under this illusion as a human that perhaps um, when I live in a certain way and don't live in a certain way, that's what puts me in a right relationship with God or not. Is that fair? And so the, uh, the, the Galatian church, mind you, this is a church that was planted probably about 14, 15 years after the resurrection of Christ, and this is all they have for the scriptures. So while they've received the gospel from Paul, all they know is Yahweh of the Old Testament and maybe some pagan gods that they have been interspersed with in their culture. The truth is, a proper reading of the Old Testament, it should create despair in us. It should create anxiety. It should create um, this, this, this recognition that there's lack, that there's a problem, and that generation after generation and mighty person after mighty person has never been able to solve it. That, that men and women are, they're separated from God and nothing that they can do brings about fixing it. And that's why you see there is this longing for Messiah at the end of the Old Testament, right? Now, their, their interpretation of who Messiah was gonna be is they wanted a, a political ruler, right? But when, when we look back and we read it, what we really see is we need a way for man to be in a right relationship with God. <coughs> um, and, and really, that is... That is I don't, I don't think that Judaism is, while it's, while it's worshiping and serving and aimed after following the one true God, at the end of the day, it is a dead religion at this point, right? It's, it's, a, it's a following of a system as a means to try to find a way to be in a right relationship with God, and all religions function this way. Um, we, we see in Judaism, right? that the whole goal is to keep the law, to keep the traditions. It's really Old Testament oriented still. They, they have not walked in the new covenant, the covenant of grace by the shed blood of Christ. And we see Jesus when he arrives on the scene and he gives his famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he is addressing all of these things that the people of the day were doing as religious acts, trying to look good in front of God and one another. And Jesus says, hey, when you're giving and you're trying to meet the needs of the needy, don't go out and slam your coins in a cup so that everyone praises you for your generosity. Ryan's paraphrase. <laughs> he says, when you pray, pray like this. Go into your closet and speak to God as if he's your heavenly father and repent of your sins and, he, and, and, and work through the needs and, and whatnot you have as opposed to standing on the street corner three or five times a day and making sure everyone sees how holy you are because you pray. God, see me, I'm praying three times a day, I'm praying five times a day. Everyone else notice how righteous I am. We see this with fasting. Jesus says, hey, when you fast, take a shower. Don't look the part, clean yourself up. Struggle on the inside, put your flesh to death, but don't make a big scene about it for everyone to notice. And when it comes to judging others, take the log out of your own eye and quit worrying about the speck in everyone else's. See, religious systems like Judaism, this, this is the fruit. God, look at me. Others, look at me. But it's, it's not exclusive to religion as Judaism. We see this in Islam, another world religion from one of the children of Abraham, right? The whole goal in Islam is to live a life of complete submission to Allah, and depending on how well you did and the mood he is in on the day you die, he may grant you eternal paradise. Let me repeat that, okay? A life of complete submission to Allah, and depending on how well you did 
and the mood he's in on the day you die, he may grant you eternal paradise. Talk about pressure, right? It's religion. Buddhism. How you live in this life will determine whether you are reincarnated into something better or worse. That is the basic premise. There's other tenets of Buddhism, but if you, if you dial it down to the simplest denominator, you better do well if you want to come back better. And if you don't do well, you're gonna come back as something worse, more vile, more lowly, and have to start all over, no pressure. <laughs> Hinduism, right? It's premised on this fact that, that the divine is in all and the divine is in you. And your life, should be, your life should be lived in such a way where you live as divine. And then ultimately, it's all about karma. It's all about sowing and reaping. If this, then that. And so the entire premise of Hinduism comes back to you better live up to the divine that's in you and do it in such a way because if you don't, it's going to boomerang back to you and it's going to get you if you didn't do it well. No pressure. I'm like getting shaky just reading through all these. I'm like, man, this is how most of the planet lives. What about our friends here? Mormonism, LDS community, right? If you do all the things the church tells you to do, your life will be blessed and you will achieve the highest form of celestial being. And if you don't, you're gonna fall on some lower rung on the ladder. It's an oversimplification, but at the end of the day, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Do everything that the church tells you to do and, and that way you can achieve celestial trophies, I guess, right? Your own planet, celestial family. What about wokeness? This is a religion, friends. The, the whole culture of our thing, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a religion. It says if you do and believe whatever nonsense the elites tell you that makes sense that you are a good person, Literally what they told you 10 years ago, it doesn't matter if it's the exact opposite now. You will agree with us, and if you do, you're a good person. Even if it doesn't follow the science that was there 10 years ago, right? And if you don't go along with it, it makes you a bad person. You're a racist, you're a conspiracy theorist, you hate women, you hate immigrants, right? You, you hate the planet, right? You're, you're basically slammed as a bad person in all these ways. No pressure. I've got to always keep up with whatever the culture and wokeness is telling me I need to go to. And by the way, this is a religion that a whole bunch of people in America and the Western world are after. And it's exhausting for them. How do I virtue signal enough? And we see the common denominator in every one of these things is it's a works-based righteousness where it's all up to you, friends. And what we just read from Paul, he says, I'm astonished that you're departing so quickly from the gospel. <clears throat> See, in the Christian faith, if you have notes here, friends, it says, I do nothing. I do nothing. I bring nothing to the table to be in a right relationship with God. I bring nothing to the table. In fact, in Romans it says, it's God's kindness that leads me to repentance. So even my act of bowing my knee before a holy God was an act of God's kindness that he granted me a heart that I would bend the knee before him. It's a gift and I do not boast in my part. Jesus did all the works. He left heaven, he sacrificed himself, he loved perfectly, he conquered death. I did none of those things, friends, you did none of those things. And any good that I do is an act of gratitude for what he's done. It's not an act of goodness so that I can achieve. Amen? Amen. My friends, this is difficult. We are inclined towards religion. We so badly want to be a part of the solution to our sin and the problems of the world. It's in our very nature. Right? God created us in his image and he's a creator. God is all powerful, but we've, we've got this corrupted, sinful 
you know, uh, part of who we are. And Paul's letter to the Galatians is written to a church who had eagerly and excitedly received the gospel and they had been set free. The chains had fallen off of their spiritual hearts and their blinded eyes, but some folks had come back in and they had been starting to lead them astray. And it's easy to lead us astray because our hearts are inclined to wanting to be part of the solution. If you write anything down, write that down. My heart, the human heart is inclined to want to help God by acting like a little God so that I feel like I cooperated in my own saving. This is not the gospel, friends. This is religion. This is Jesus plus. And as, G as Paul would say, and we're gonna get into this, that's really no gospel at all because it puts us right back into playing a part that our shoulders can't carry. Martin Luther, one of the great reformers, okay, we had Martin Luther, we had John Calvin and, and the likes, and they're looking around at the church and they're like, what has this become? And Martin Luther, if you study his life and, and history, he was a Pharisee of his day. And, and what I mean by that is not that he was Jewish, right? But what I mean by that is he had took hook, line, and sinker that the Catholic Church messaging of the day was you are saved by grace through the blood of Jesus and now you better work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And what that meant is you need to help yourself stay in a right relationship with God. You need to help ultimately keep yourself saved. So much so that Martin Luther expresses that he lived his life with this great pressure and anxiety because it was the gospel plus religion. And in fact, he says that when he read the book of Galatians, that is what the Holy Spirit used to break off the chains of religion in his life. And that's what we're jumping into now. Here's three quotes from Martin Luther about the book of Galatians. He says, this is talking about humanity in general. He says, to be convinced in our hearts that we have forgiveness of sins and peace with God by grace alone is the hardest thing. What he's saying is we always try to add to the grace of God. <clears throat> the next quote, he says, the article of justification must be sounded in our ears, meaning we need to hear it all the time. In the articles of, of justification must be sounded in our ears incessantly, because of the frailty of our flesh. And it, our flesh will not permit, it, permit us to take hold of it perfectly and to believe it with all our heart. Paraphrasing what Martin Luther is saying there is we must always have the gospel of grace preached to us because while our spirit accepts it, our flesh rejects it and our heart struggles to really walk in and embrace it. We always want to add to it. Last quote here, he says, did Christ die or did he not die? This is a rhetorical question. Was his death worthwhile or was it not? If his death was worthwhile, it follows that righteousness does not come by the law. Why was Christ born anyway? Why was he crucified and why did he suffer and why did he love me and give himself for me? It was all done to no purpose if righteousness is to be had by the law. So said another way, if, if it's really about me keeping the law and a works-based righteousness, then what all the stuff that Jesus did coming from heaven, bleeding, suffering, dying, conquering death, what does it matter? It's of no value if I can add to it or I can do it myself. The entire gospel is predicated on the fact of what God has done, not what I do. Amen? So with that being said, we're going to enter into Galatians, and we're going to work our way through the first 10 verses this morning. Some of this is going to be history, some is going to be context, but I pray this is not just information. I pray that God is working in your heads and in your hearts so that he is working out the same freedom that he did for Martin Luther and he's done, and he did for Paul, 
and he was doing for the Galatian church and he's done for countless believers throughout history. Pray with me, church. God, we come before you this morning and is our tendency to try to add to the gospel. It is against our nature apart from your spirit renewing us, God, to, to not try to be God of our own lives, to not try to give you an assist. But God, if that's the case, then it's really no gospel at all, is it? So Lord, I pray for this church, Lord. I pray for our time together. I pray for everyone who's not here that will get caught up with us. Lord, I pray that as we work through uh, Galatians, Lord, we would just capture the themes but I pray that those themes would move from the head to the heart, Lord, and from the heart to the very way we live. God, I pray that uh, any person here who is walking in religion or has a tendency towards it, just like I do, God, I pray that you would set us free from that during this series, Lord, and the gospel would be preached and we'd receive it with gladness and we'd be free in Christ. And we lift this up in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, church, so the first verse we got here as we're kind of working through this introduction in the, in the letter of Galatians is Paul says, Paul, an apostle, and he says, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. When he says Paul, an apostle, you have to realize that what we're gonna get to in just a minute here is Paul is going to go on blast against a group of people called the Judaizers. And they are claiming religious authority over the church in Galatia. So Paul is basically introducing his letter saying, hey, I'm one-upping the people that have been teaching you since I left. That's what I'm doing. Listen to me, not them. And he says, I'm an apostle. And what is an apostle? Well, an apostle is someone who is an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus and that is called and commissioned by God to proclaim the mysteries of the gospel. And Paul is saying, I received that calling. And if we remember, right, we have this story about Paul was on his way to basically persecute the church and Jesus knocked him off his metaphorical high horse and blinded him and humbled him and basically took years to restore him before he commissioned him to be an ambassador of the gospel to the Gentiles, including the area of Galatia. And what Paul recognizes is that this is not from men nor through men. So Paul is saying, I am claiming spiritual authority here. The message I bring you and the apostolic calling that I have does, is not rooted in religious tradition or men or anything like that. This is rooted in the very spirit of God as the commissioner of this apostolic calling. He's saying, I didn't give this to myself, and in fact, in other areas, he, he talks about his training as a, as a Jew, and he's like, I was, I was perfect in all these things, but that's not what he's leaning on here. He's saying, no, God commissioned me to do this. And then he says, all the brothers who are with me, um, it's important to understand we're gonna see a few themes in the book of Galatians, but one of them is Paul is basically recognizing, hey, th there's a whole group of believers out there that I'm doing life with, and when you're kinda in the club, when, when, when you follow Jesus and you're in Christ, um, you are now uh, surrounded by brothers and sisters that have your back and they care about your best interest. And, and so in some ways, Paul is saying that, hey, I'm not the only one who's concerned about you. <coughs> Word has gotten out what you guys are up to, and this isn't just me, although I'm the one writing the letter. There is great concern for how this church is departing and going down a different road. And these people are here with me, and, and what I have to say to you, they affirm, and it's their message to you as well. <clears throat> then we get to the next part. It says, to the churches of Galatia. So um, let's kind of do a really quick, like who, what, when, where, why type thing. So who were the churches in Galatia? We see in, in Acts chapter 13 and 14 that Paul is traveling, and we see here that on his missionary journey, he, he is, helps plant this church in around 46 or 47 AD. Um, <clears throat> and the, when he says the churches in Galatia, 
The, er, the New Testament churches, they didn't build megachurch buildings. They met in houses. They met in local synagogues. They meet in town centers. And so what would happen is you go in, you preach the gospel, you raise up some elders, those people, and they start sharing the gospel. It spreads throughout the Jewish community, reach out to the pagan community, and now you basically have the church functioning as the people of God rather than as a gathering in a building. And so when he's saying the churches, the, the implication here is that the gospel went forth to this region, but it's already multiplied. That's what the Holy Spirit was up to, and we see this all throughout Acts. Paul seems to be writing this letter approximately one year after he had just there been planting the church, around 48 AD. For perspective, Jesus, as best we can tell according to the calendar, he resurrected and ascended around 33 AD. So this is a mere 15 years after Jesus left planet Earth to go reign in heaven until he returns. And in those 15 years, the gospel has spread like wildfire, just like Jesus had said it would when he said, I send the Holy Spirit and I commission you, go. But the church is still relatively young. 15 years is not a long time in the grand scheme of things when you have century-old pagan religions and century-old Judaism in the region. Um, how do we get this dating? I think this is important. Has anyone ever heard of the Jerusalem Council? Okay, this happened around 50 AD. And this is when all of these believers in the gospel and in Jesus Christ gathered in Jerusalem to work out questions like, well, now that we're Christians, but it's the same God, Yahweh, but now we're believing in Yeshua as Messiah, what do we do with the law? This was the big question. And, and, and we're going to get in this in three weeks from now. We'll work through this. But there's, there's basically, and I, Tanner and I had a conversation about this a few weeks ago, there's different aspects of the law. There's the moral law. That would be like the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. That is eternal, friends. There has never been a time when I'm not called to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love my neighbor as myself. Jesus said all of the commandments could be summed up in this. But then there was the civil law and the ceremonial law, which is how do we basically set up society? And they were wrestling with questions about diet. Are we allowed to eat pig or not? <laughs> right? What about circumcision? Do we still need to do that? Is that the sign of being in covenant relationship with God or is it something else? This all happened in a big council in Jerusalem in around the year 50 and Paul does not mention that in his letter. <coughs> the teaching and the conclusions at the Jerusalem council are con completely consistent with what Paul teaches to the church in Galatians. Why is this important? because that helps us date this letter. This happened as the church was wrestling through this on a major level all over the place throughout the region. And Paul is just one of the first ones to address it before they had a full council about it. Where is the church in Galatia? Where was this region? Modern day Turkey. Think about 200 miles or so, kind of northwest of Jerusalem. So if you think of Jerusalem on a map, Right, kind of at the corner, at the, I guess, three o'clock of the sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea. Go about 150 miles, hang a left and go another 50 miles, about 200 miles up to the region of Galatia. For perspective, that would be the same as kind of going by foot from here to Salt Lake or to Boise. That's about how far away it is from Jerusalem where the, where the Jerusalem church basically launched. Um, what is the occasion? Because everything we're going to read, it, when we read a letter, we, we sometimes we're, it's almost like we're listening to a telephone conversation, right? You've heard me say this before, where we can't hear what the other person is saying, we can just hear what one person's saying. That's very often how a letter is, and Paul is writing a letter clearly responding to either what he has heard firsthand or secondhand and what's going on in the churches in the region there. <coughs> And what this letter is, it's a strongly worded warning and rebuke against those who are teaching and practicing a works-based salvation. That's what it is. As Paul would call it, it's a false gospel. Paul is blasting the believers in Galatia for departing from the gospel that he brought them just one year earlier that they believed with joy, and now he's astonished that they're departing. But he's also blasting this group called the Judaizers. These are these people that hold themselves out as religious leaders, and he's basically like, they're fools, they don't know anything. <coughs> um, 
And then just a couple themes that we're gonna look at. If you're writing down themes, they're right here on the screen, would be faith in Christ alone, right? It's not a works-based righteousness. Um, we see even Abraham pre-law, right? He was in a right relationship with God. What? Based on faith. Uh, we see the family of God. You are in Christ, and you are called out of the evil, evil present age. We see freedom in Christ. It's a famous verse, right? It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. You have been rescued from sin and death. You have not been freed into freedom to sin. Right? Grace is not a license to abuse God's goodness. Grace is the means by which we are saved. And then lastly, uh, we are the, another theme is that what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Paul calls himself a servant. Some people call themselves Christians. But the, the idea here is that our allegiance, first and foremost, and our identity has to be in Christ. So moving on to verse three, it says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself, what? For our sins, to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. This is kind of a standard format introduction to a letter. If you read through the other letters that Paul wrote, they're called epistles. In every single one of them, he'll, uh, he'll do kind of an introductory. And he'll say things like grace and peace, which were common Christian greetings. This is just my two cents. I could be wrong on this, but when you read his intro here compared to future letters, I get the feeling that he learned, hey, that was a little bit too terse, Paul. <laughs> that was a little bit too abrupt, a little bit too direct. Maybe work on your soft skills a little bit. Because in future letters, he gives a little bit longer and softer greetings before he jumps into the teaching. But he basically says, yep, peace, grace, now let me get to what I'm really, but it's coming from a place of real concern. But what does he say here? Paul, uh, he says, hey, I'm wishing grace, which is basically unmerited favor and peace upon your re um, his readers, but it's coming, you can read, it's coming from a place of frustration. It's coming from a place of love and care and concern for the Galatian church, which he jumps into is already off track just one year later. And what it says here is Paul is making clear what? That the days are evil. And that Jesus gave himself up according to the will of God to deliver and set those free who would love and trust him from the clenches of the evil days. And then Paul makes it clear it's all about God and it's all about his glory. Maybe you don't get as frustrated by this as I do, but I'm gonna speak from the heart. Does anyone ever get frustrated at false teaching out there? <laughs> right? Isn't it aggravating? Sometimes I wonder, I've actually wrestled, I, I mean, I'm trying to wrestle with God, right? It, it's, it's me sitting on my couch with a journal or a cup of coffee or whatever, but metaphorically wrestling with God, I'm like, God, why do you let so many people drag your name through the mud? Why do you let people say so many crazy and slanderous things in your name? Like, ha defend your honor, God. Defend your glory. They're saying nonsensical, even wicked things and attributing it to you. Does anyone get frustrated by that? It drives me crazy. Um, and, and I think that's like where that's coming from in Paul's situation. He's like, you, you, you Judaizers are claiming the name of Jesus, but you're ascribing to him things that he never said. And Paul's got like a righteous frustration and indignation there. Um, I, I am so alarmed actually in our culture, even how quiet and almost passive we as the church have become so many times to people saying blasphemous things in the name of God. And it's like we've been trained in our culture into this idea of tolerance, right? Well, be a nice person and don't say anything because you wouldn't want to offend anybody. It's a cultural value. It's not a biblical value. And we need to kind of look ourselves in the mirror and go, man, when am I bowing to the evil age's expectations of me versus when am I being more like Jesus or more like Paul or more like Peter and confronting in truth and in love that which is errant. We need to be bold, church. We see this from Paul. 
<clears throat> then we jump on to verse 6 here. And this is, this is now we're getting to this point where we listen to this language. He goes, I'm astonished. This could be like I'm surprised. My stomach is turning, right? I'm upset. I'm agitated that you are so quickly deserting him. Notice who he's accusing him of deserting. He's not saying you're deserting some theological nebulous thing out there. He's like, no, you're deserting the one who shed his blood for you. Him, Jesus. You're deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Notice their intention, their motive is set on distortion and deception. Paul expresses surprise in a way where he kind of asks the question, why would you go backwards? And Paul levels an accusation here at the church. And his accusation is not that God has departed you, but what? That you've departed him. Have you ever felt abandoned by God only to later realize that you were the one to walk away? Anybody? Right? I have done that so many times. I'm like, I'm like praying. I'm like, God, where did you go? And then in his mercy and his kindness, weeks or months or even years later, he shows me, I I've been right here the whole time. <laughs> you are the one that started chasing an idol. Or you are the one, right, that started putting expectations on me that I never committed to. I've already proven my love to you. I, I laid it all in the line for you. Perhaps at one point you were really healthy, exercising, uh, eating right, sleeping well, and then you got busy or developed bad habits. Anyone ever had that happen? Right? Like you set out. <laughs> I, that got a lot of reaction, right? No, it's never happened to me. Every single one of us at some point, we were running a race of something. Take it out of spiritual for a minute. That was really important to us, and we were doing a good job. And then somehow, some way, we either got tired or we got lazy or we got distracted or we took our eye off the ball or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, going back to my message a few weeks ago, it's no longer, man, looking good. It's not bad to, oh, not good. <coughs> right? <clears throat> Paul is scratching his head and he's saying, hey, I was just there last year. I'm astonished. What the heck happened in a short 12 months? Right? How did you, in that short period of time, depart? You were living in the grace of Christ. You were experiencing the goodness of God and the freedom that he offers. You were healthy. You were doing well. And now some have come in who are troubling you, is the language he uses. <clears throat> you have turned to that which is distorted, unhealthy, and not the gospel at all. One of the things we don't talk about enough in the modern church, because it's no fun to talk about, and it's a, we live in a pluralistic, tolerant, oriented culture. Has anyone ever taken the time, I've not, but if you have and you know the answer, please let me know, to, to note how many times warning against false teaching happens in the New Testament? Jesus warns repeatedly about false teaching. Paul, and I think every single letter, warns against it. Peter warns against it. The Apostle John warns against it. Jude warns against it. Paul, in his letters to Timothy, warns against it. There's easily upwards of 50 warnings and references in the New Testament to not be led astray by any other false teaching. Verse 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, now so I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. It doesn't sound like very nice language, does it? How do you think it would go for you if you went up to someone and, and said, hey, 
you keep doing what you're doing, you be cursed. People take too kindly to that? No. This is not nice language. The, the word in Greek is anathema. <coughs> um, the, the better translation would be if someone is preaching to you a contrary gospel, let them be set apart for spiritual damnation. That's probably a better rendering of what Paul is saying there. Let them be anathema. Let them be set aside for the destruction of their souls for what they're doing. And what's interesting here, I think this is super relevant given the context of our church and where we're living, is he also says, um, <coughs> but even if an angel should preach a different message. Guys, when you look up uh, on Wikipedia, I'm just gonna read something to you. It says, uh, first of all, we live in a culture and in a community where we have uh, a number of, I believe, misguided, many well-intentioned people that they are believing another gospel that was delivered by a supposed angel. <coughs> Listen to this, the angel Moroni is an angel whom Joseph Smith, founder of the Latter-day Saint movement, reported as having visited him on numerous occasions beginning on September 21st, 1823. According to Smith, the angel Moroni was the guardian of the golden plates buried near his home in western New York, which Latter-day Saints believe is the source of the Book of Mormon. An important figure in the theology of the Latter-day Saint movement is Moroni, and he's featured prominently in its architecture and art. Besides Smith, the three witnesses and several other witnesses also reported that they saw Moroni in visions in 1829. Moroni is thought by Latter-day Saints to be the same person as the Book of Mormon prophet warrior named Moroni, who was the last to write in the Golden Plates. According to the Book of Mormon, an angel Moroni was a pre-Columbian warrior who buried the Golden Plates, and after he died, he became an angel who was tasked with directing Smith to their location in the 1820s. According to Smith, he then returned to the golden plates to Moroni after they were translated, and as of 1838, Moroni still had the plates in his possession. <coughs> you think Paul's prophetic? Right, he literally says, hey, if someone comes to you, even if it's an angel, and delivers a gospel, a message that's even a little bit off, that is a message of spiritual damnation. Question, did the angel Moroni to Joseph Smith deliver the same gospel? It's a different gospel. As Paul would say up above, it's not really a gospel at all then. And what do we know about this gospel that was delivered? Is it by grace through faith? Or does it include works? Putting the pressure right back on. I believe it's Paul, when, when you study church history and you study Paul and you look at his writings and I've had to read all these books for seminary and like you, you have people that are like literary analysis type people, which I'm not. They point out a lot of things to you that you, you wouldn't normally catch just reading. And one of the things that was pointed out to me repeatedly by some of my professors in the readings is that Paul is a very intentional writer, right? Like it's not like he just woke up one day and he's like just jotted down and then sends it off. Like he's very strategic. Obviously we believe it was under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's also just a very shrewd and wise and calculated person in what he's saying. And you have to wonder this is just pure speculation here, folks. This isn't in the text, but you have to wonder, was that perhaps what was going on? Something similar, right? Were perhaps the Judaizers that were coming in saying, hey, we received special divine revelation, right? And they're claiming that authority as a way to change the gospel. This is what false teachers do. They claim to hear from God or a divine inspiration, and then they lead people down a different path every single time. They never claim that it was rooted in their own mind. They always attribute it 
to God or an angelic being or a visitation or something like that. And it's very likely that what was happening in the first century church right there is these Judaizers that were coming in, they had a grasp of Judaism, they had an understanding of the gospel, and they're saying, but we got special revelation. And this is the actual gospel. Forget what Paul says, forget what Peter says. This is how you're in a right relationship with God. Blood of Jesus plus. <coughs> it is the duty of the Christian to call this out and root it out immediately. Because what you're doing is you're watering down, just like Martin Luther said, like, wh why even have Jesus die and mess with all that stuff then if I'm going to add back to it? Church, this is why it's so important when we announce Bible study groups and, and discipleship groups and all these sort of things. This is why it's so important to be in the Word of God because we are to test the spirits, we are to test the teaching, we are to test what people are saying in the name of God to the actual word of God. That is our Christian duty. That is how we are like Bereans who are commended in scripture. We must always test the spirits and any spiritual claim against the written word of God. <clears throat> Lastly, Paul ends with this in this section of the intro to his letter. Let's consider his question here. He says, for Am I now seeking? Bas think, think of this before we read this. He, he's, he's writing this question to the, to the churches in Galatia, basically, please consider my motives, is what he's asking them to do. Please consider my motives as I'm rebuking you and as I'm coming strongly at you. It's from a place of love, but not only that, I want you to know where my allegiances lie. And Paul says, for am I now seeking the approval of man? or of God? <coughs> Am I trying to please man? If he was, is this how I'd be going at him? No, he says, if I were still trying to please man, then I would not be a servant of Christ. He basically draws a line in the sand and says, hey, there, you, you can't do both. Is this not consistent with what Jesus taught? Some of you, to pick up your cross and follow me, you're going to have to walk away from family members that won't understand. You may lose a job. You may lose your well-being. You may lose whatever. But Paul is saying, if that is what is of actual concern to me, then I cannot consider myself a Christ follower or a servant of Christ. It has to be one or the other. Today we use words like Christian, like Christ follower. What do these words mean? Tanner, you can go ahead and come up here. What do these words mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christ follower? Well, we clearly know that it starts and ends with a right understanding of the gospel, right? That Christ <coughs> is the one who fixed the despair that we feel when we read the Old Testament because we can't fix the gap between God and ourselves. Only he can do it. And only he has done it, right? We, when, when we live in such a holy way or a righteous way, it's nothing but a response because we love him because he loved us first. However, we all have a tendency to be led astray. We all have a tendency for things to come in and become idolatrous or to become servants of other things. And some of those things can even be good. It can be leisure. It can be friends. It can be public service. It can be acts of service in church. It can be benevolence. We can, we can do good things without Christ having our full heart. So the question I'd ask you, church, and this is not something I can answer for you, this is something between you and the Holy Spirit, but whose approval are you seeking? At the end of the day, when you sit down and you pray to God and you get up each morning, is it an audience of one? Paul is saying about everything else I'm about to go through with you, I want you to know my state of position is this. And this isn't mere talk. In fact, his life 
backs up that his whole devotion was to Jesus. So much so that it cost him everything. Now, this is not a message for you, church, where it's like, let me go introduce suffering into my life so that I can prove my love to Jesus and therefore get back into a workspace relation relationship with God. That is not what we're talking about here. But it is a point of consideration. Paul says, and he asked the question that every one of us need to consider. Am I after my own approval? Am I after the approval of my neighbor? Am I after the approval of God Almighty? Please bow your heads, church. Lord, we come together this morning and we thank you for your, for your holy and inspired letter through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, to a church that you gave and shed your blood for. You love each and every person in that church in Galatia, and you would have done it all just for them because of your great love. You are such a good God. And God, it is so difficult for us to walk in grace. always want to add something to it. But Lord, I pray that you would just minister, minister to us, us this morning. Where instead of trying to bring anything to you, we simply bring our hearts. Say, God, I'm yours. as we work through this series, Lord, each and every person here, Lord, they would just be washed in your grace anew. And if there's anything that they're holding on to, ahead of you, in addition to you, Lord, that you just help release their grip of that. feel your embrace, Lord, and they would hug you back. So God, we pray, uh, we pray that you just pour out your love on this church. Lord, I pray for every, every, any person here that doesn't know you, that they've never really experienced your grace, God, and they're trying to add to the equation. Lord, I pray that they would just feel that in their spirit and know that they're, they're, they're trying to do it themselves, Lord, and they just come ask questions of Sam or myself or anyone else, God, and, and that we can work through this. <clears throat> and Lord, I pray for every person here that, that has the tendency to be saved by grace and then over time start pursuing idols or start trying to add to the mix, Lord. I pray that uh, in this moment, in this morning, during this series, God, you would just help them be free. And we thank you for your love and we thank you for your sacrifice, Lord, and we thank you for your gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
us finish the song. Church.